invite you now to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we offer our thanks for this day and the privilege that we have to worship you. And so now, as we read and hear the words of Scripture, we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to inspire these words in our hearing, that they may become for us the living word. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Listen now to scripture as I read it to you from the Gospel of Luke. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor, in the case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come, to, come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, Move up higher, then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also, he said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When our daughter was three years old, she was asked by the little neighbor girl whose name was Nicole, to have dinner with her family. This was her first time away from us at a friend's house for dinner. We were a bit nervous as parents and wanted to be sure that our child was you know, behaved in the best way possible. And so we gave her a lot of advice about how to conduct herself while at the table. Now be sure to wash your hands before you eat and wait until they tell you where to sit. Don't take any chair. And then we advised her she was not to talk too much and that she was supposed to eat everything that was put in front of her, at least a no thank you portion. And of course, please Emily, avoid spilling your milk or food. Well, we just sat in nervous worry as she had her first dinner invitation. And then she returned and we debriefed with her. Come on now, you parents do that too. What did they eat? Did you eat everything? What did they visit about? And then I asked, you know, that pastoral question, did they say grace before dinner? Our daughter immediately replied to that question, no, they forgot, but I reminded them, Dad. <laughs> and manners are complex. And they reflect many of our values. And we know that when we host a dinner, there are some expectations that we have. You know, the guest list should include people who are comfortable with each other. You know, they should be seated at the table in a way that will encourage conversation. There should be enough food. And the guests invited to the dinner are also to behave in some type of prescribed manner. Otherwise, they will not be invited again. In 1922, Emily Post, do you remember Emily Post? She gave etiquette advice for those who were attending a dinner party. She said, don't pretend to know more than you do. Well, that would knock out half the conversation, wouldn't it? <laughs> to say that you have read a book and then seemingly to understand nothing of what you have read proves you to be a halfwit. Above all, stop and think what you are saying. 
And that would knock out the other half of the conversation. <laughs> but it's practical advice, isn't it? Today's text from Luke, the text that I just read to you, is etiquette for guests and hosts at a dinner party, at a banquet. And it too is practical advice about how you might behave if you are invited to one or if you are throwing one. But it is much, much more than that. In this encounter, Jesus gave us practical and clear advice about how we might live. And it can be summed up with just two words. In all things, practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Table manners and customs were important in the Middle Ancient Middle Eastern culture. There were all types of norms and rules that prescribed the behavior that was expected, both from hosts and from the guests. Where someone sat, who was invited, and how one behaved at dinner mattered. If you go through the Gospel of Luke, Notice how often Jesus was eating and drinking with others. It's interesting. You know, it was over meals that people connected with each other. It was over meals that ideas and friendships were forged and ideas were shared. It was over meals. Do we read that Jesus taught, gave lessons? The rules governing these meals were tight. And we observe that Jesus often broke them to the horror of his hopes. On one occasion, for example, he did not wash properly, and he was accused of being unclean, to which he replied that his Pharisee accuser was also unclean where it really mattered, unclean of heart. We also read that Jesus ate and drank with sinners and with all types of people, the Pharisees, the wealthy, the poor, Samaritans, and women, the latter two being no-nos. And in this chapter of Luke, he taught a new standard of etiquette for guests and hosts. We read in the text of Luke that they watched him closely. And why? Well, they wanted to catch him doing something wrong. They wanted to catch him in the act. But we, too, should watch him closely. Why? So that we might discover the right way to live. You know, Jesus' message was clear and it was direct. He said, do this. Always in the active indicative, or really you know, uh, in the imperative. But he also tied his imperatives to eternal truths about the nature of reality and the kingdom of God. There was also always an eternal reason for simple behavior for the guests. He tells them not to take the best seats in the house. Do not presume to be so important. Why? Well, you might embarrass yourself. It's pretty practical, isn't it? You might be asked to move. You might have to get up, take your napkin, your drink, go to the next table. A little bit of trouble. Jesus was teaching a lesson in humility. Don't be so presumptuous about how important you are. Behave humbly. <coughs> but behind this admonition was an eternal truth, a truth that he was trying to communicate in everything that he said, and that was everyone who makes himself great will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be made great. Act humbly at all times. But the second teaching was directed at the host. Now here he says, you know, this is who should be invited. When you have a dinner, think about it. Who are you most likely to invite? Probably friends, relatives, perhaps some neighbors that you admire and want to get to know better because you hope that they'll invite you back and a friendship will be established. But Jesus takes this and turns it upside down. When you have a dinner party, invite the poor the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Once again, this was a direct teaching, and it's a command of Christ. We can't wonder this down. It, should, it would sound offensive to the ancient listener. Why? Because the lame, the poor, the crippled, 
were considered to be ritually unclean, and they were unacceptable to share food with. You did not want them at your table. In Philadelphia, in the center of the city, there's a Presbyterian church that has a Sunday evening dinner every week. Elegant affair. White tablecloth, a flower at every table. Servers who bring the food to the table. Even a menu with a choice of two or three entrees. Wouldn't you like to have a Sunday evening dinner like that? So well done. The food is prepared by some of the best chefs in all of Philadelphia who volunteer their time for this dinner. As I said, it's an elegant affair. This weekly meal is for the city's homeless, for outcasts, for those who cannot go to restaurants. Some are dressed up, but most are not. At the table are members of the congregation and guests, guests from the streets. Diners do not have to give their zip code. They don't have to say they're poor. They don't have to show that they really are hungry or destitute. They just show up and enjoy a tasty, healthy meal. When you have dinner, have a dinner, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Invite them. The eternal truth that Jesus links with this command is that God rewards, the, rewards behavior that benefits those who are poor, alienated. The ones whom Jesus called the least of these, my brothers and sisters. And I ask you, could a message be any more direct? Who are the guests at our tables? One of the realities of our day is that I think people are hungry. Not only hungry for good food, but they're hungry. There's another type of hunger. And this hunger is as primal as our hunger for good food. It is the hunger for a connection to God and to others. The hunger is expressed in so many ways. It's expressed in our striving to make something of ourselves, to be great, so that perhaps we might be a little more acceptable to others. We hope that we can, through our striving, earn some favor with God. We hunger for meaning. We hunger for some experience of the divine. You know, New Age spirituality did not develop in a vacuum. It developed in a response to this pervasive hunger in our society. Ironically, a hunger that we have failed to address. We're also hungry for connection to each other. We want to be accepted. It is a human reality. You know, one of the most powerful ideas in all the world, I think, is friendship. Friendship. Friendship is the connection between people that binds them together for no other reason that, except that they enjoy being with one another. You know, friendship is also able to bridge unbelievable differences. Religious differences, political differences, social differences. Friendships reach across the gaps of gender, age, generation, race, language, and ideology. We, need, we read in the scriptures that Jesus was a friend, a friend of sinners. And a Sunday school song that we used to love to sing was, What a Friend! we have in Jesus. But who are our friends? And who does Jesus befriend? And we, can we befriend those who are the friends of Christ? Do we seek to befriend those whom Jesus claims? Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven like a great banquet, a dinner party. He shared the guest list with us in this passage. And who's on that list? The poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And we need to ask ourselves, are we including the guests whom Jesus included in our lives? And if not, can we find the moral courage to include them? 
There's a message here for us as individuals, but also for us as a congregation, as Poland Presbyterian Church. Now, when a church has existed for 200 years, over 200 years, it develops patterns and traditions that are often the source of its strength. Anything that lasts for more than a generation, I think, is strong and has done something right. And when you last for, when you exist for over 200 years, there is a history of doing things correctly. And yet, for some, these traditions which we hold also serve to keep them outside. And they become an unconscious barrier to hospitality. A congregation of this size has many different groups that are friendly and they provide support to members who have been here a long time. You have your friends here at the church and sometimes those groups are tight and they grow tight and people who come discover them and wonder how can I break into these groups. Newcomers and visitors may feel that they are not a part of things. You know, congregations that are dynamic, ones that are growing, have a culture. A culture of wealth that welcomes innovation, new ideas, new leadership, and is active in mission beyond the walls. And it welcomes in people who are new, different, and bring new ideas, and respects them for those new ideas and the gifts that they bring, without saying, we've always done it this way, or we tried that a year ago, it didn't work. It's a different day. Karen and I have been touched by the ways you have invited us into your lives and into your groupings. We've shared many meals with many people here, and I want to, I want to encourage you to continue to extend this hospitality to others who are in your midst. Hospitality to the visitor, the guest, the stranger. This is vital and it's an important biblical command. Christ tells us to do it. Invite them to your book groups, to your homes, to your classes. Listen to their stories and honor the gifts that they bring. Practice hospitality. Let me share with you an example of the opposite of church hospitality. It was one of the most painful moments for me in my ministry. It occurred some 20 years ago in Texas. I received a letter that contained within it another note. The letter was from someone who had visited the congregation I served. It was her first visit. You know, it was an anonymous letter. It was her first visit. And this church was, you know, a large, it was exciting, it was a church that prided itself on being you know, progressive and you know, open to others. The writer told how she parked her car in our parking lot. Apparently the first person who parked that day placed their car over a line, you know, did not get into the right space, and consequently every other car was moved down so that it was parked over the line and no one was parked within the lines. She stayed for the second service. And when she went to her car, she noticed that all the cars were gone and that she now had occupied two spaces, although through no fault of her own. This note was attached to her car. It was scribbled on a bulletin. Quote, you have taken two parking places. I have been a charter member of this congregation and when I came to worship today, you were taking two spaces and I could not find a space. Your selfishness obviously shows that you need to worship more than I do. Then hear the message of Jesus. Practice hospitality. Welcome the stranger. Be gracious to one another. I'm sure that this visitor was never seen again. But this sad tale had a somewhat happy ending. I read the letter to our elders the next session meeting. The following week, signs appeared at the best parking places in the church lot, reserved for our visitors. The best seat in the house, the best space in the parking lot, is often reserved for the most important gifts, guests. 
Jesus calls us to ponder who sits there. Jesus calls us to practice hospitality. Amen.